morning. This morning's reading is taken from the book of Colossians, beginning at verse 1 and finishing at verse 14. This can be found in the Church Bibles on page 1182. Page 1182, Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Thanks be to God. And Christine, thank you so much for reading that passage of scripture, which we're going to look at now. So if you'd like to uh, keep it open on your lap or boot up your gizmo and find Colossians chapter 1, you'll be, um, you'll be able to follow along. And in the news sheet for today, there's a page you can take some notes. I strongly recommend that you, that you do that. My friends, it's lovely to be back with you. It's a joy to share worship and the word once again together. And um, it's a great privilege for me, too, to be able to start off this series on Colossians, although I'm very aware that Chris has already explained to you the link with the book of Philemon, so that uh, you have some context in which to put what we're studying today. I, I, I wonder if we could have the laptop up on the screen. It'd be great if we could. Super. I, I have a problem with the English language, um, or at least one word in it. You know... Let me give you, a, give you a for instance. Someone takes their phone and takes a picture of their dinner and puts it up on Facebook, as you do. <laughs> and, and, and then the comments come flooding in. And I have seen this. One of them just says, awesome. Really? It's your dinner. <laughs> just eat it. And here is my problem. What word do I use when I find something that genuinely is awesome? Because we've used that word to death. And that's what we have in Colossians. What we have here, and really what gives rise to your, your title, which is Jesus First on this, this series, is some of the highest statements about Christ 
anywhere in the Bible. Technically, we say this contains the highest Christology of the New Testament. Jesus Christ is awesome. And what we have in him is truly awesome. So I want my theme for well, today uh, in, in two parts. The first is this. I want us to highlight the thing that Paul says right at the beginning, which is, we always give thanks to God for you. <coughs> Can I take you to the day I first encountered the book of Colossians? I was nine. It was an unexceptional Sunday morning. My mother had coaxed me into my Sunday suit, a smart little grey number with short trousers and long socks. Let's just not go there, shall we? <laughs> and, and, and black shoes that I'd had to buff to a mirror shine the night before. And she looked me in the eye and she produced something from her TARDIS-like handbag. Here, she said, this is for you. And she handed me a notebook. Now, you can take notes on Daddy's sermons. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I knew perfectly well, this was just another ruse to stop Ian fidgeting while his father was preaching in church that Sunday. What she didn't know was that the day before, I had helped myself to a small handful of coffee beans from the blue tin in the kitchen. And I'd secreted these beans in the little money pocket in the grey suit that I was wearing, along with my collection for the day, which was a 12-sided threepenny bit. Well, the sermon arrived, and my father began, this series on, began his series on the book of Colossians. And while he preached his heart out, I sucked my coffee beans, one at a time, and uh, used the notebook to make up magic squares now, for those of you who are, uh, who've never encountered these wonders, um, a magic square is a little three by three, you can do four by four if you like, but a little three by three arrangement. You take any nine consecutive numbers and your task is to arrange those digits in the nine, nine cells of the square so that they add up to the same number on all three horizontal rows, all three vertical columns and the two diagonals. Do you know, I, some of you are going to spend the rest of this morning, <laughs> I can see it coming. God dear, don't change, do you? Uh, so far as my father's preaching was concerned, I don't think I remember a word of it. But what I vividly remember was this. He was talking about this book and about the person of Christ with such passion and such love and such gratitude and such enthusiasm that I may not have understood it intellectually with my nine-year-old mind, but there was something deeply compelling about the way he was saying it. And I was moved by his bubbling joy and his utter earnestness as he preached this book. That's why I am really quite thrilled to have the opportunity to unpack the beginning of this book for you. Because it just bubbles over with joy and with gratitude. And you might be interested to know if you're interested in uh, Ian White trivia. I've never preached on this before. Um, I've done several series on Colossians, but it's always been in a team situation and I've given this passage to somebody else to preach. Probably that's what Chris has done for me, but there you go. Um, I, I'm sure Chris has already explained to you, at one level, this is just a bog-standard first-century Greek letter. Look at verse 1. Who it's from? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Yes, he extends it slightly, but it's just, there are the facts. Who's it to? Verse 2. To God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. Again, it's a conventional two, although he does extend it a bit. So this letter was for the Christ followers in Colossae. And my friend, if you're a Christ follower today, here at Victoria, then it's for you too. And I know Chris has already uh, explained to you the links between this book and the New Testament book of Philemon. It's a fascinating piece of, uh, of, of biblical background work. 
And I thoroughly recommend you go listen to his message from, from last, was it last week or the week before? On this, last week on the book of Philemon. So today, we're going to start with Paul's content in verse 3. And I want to encourage you, I want to motivate you, and I want to uh, inspire you to be thankful to God and to live for him. Those are the two things that come out of this passage that I want us to remember from this morning. Look at verse 3. We, says Paul, Timothy and I, we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. Now, I can't help feeling that if I was writing this letter, I wouldn't have started like that. I think I'd probably have said, guys, please pray for us. I'm in prison. I don't know how long I'll be here or if I'll ever be released. Life sucks and I need you to stand with me. But not Paul. There's an attitude of gratitude weaving its way through these verses that brings Paul enormous happiness. We always thank God for you every time we pray for you. Now Paul had every reason imaginable to plead for our sympathy and our support, but instead he and Timothy are grateful. I shall never forget helping a middle-aged man come to faith and take his first steps as a believer. A few days after he'd become a Christian, I was chatting with him. He turned up in church and I asked him if he'd noticed any difference. And, and, he, and he dropped this little thing into the conversation. He said, Ian, you know, at last, I've got someone to thank. Isn't that lovely? He twigged that God loved him and he was grateful for that. Paul and Timothy made the headline sentence of their letter, we always thank God every time we pray for you. <clears throat> and can I, can I be personal just for a moment? Rosie and I always thank God every time we pray for you. And why? I think the reasons that uh, we feel that kind of joy and gratitude are very similar to the reasons that Paul and Timothy had here. Look at verse 4. We have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for God's people. Clearly, the Colossian believers had established a pattern of healthy Christian life and witness. They loved God and they loved each other. Come within 10 metres of them and you'd spot the difference. One of the great joys that I had when I was the pastor here is to say to people who are not used to coming to church, well, just turn up. If you want to know what being a Christian is like, just come because what you see is what you'll get. Just look around you. And that faith was driven by the confident hope that this life is not all there is. Look at verse 5. We thank God for the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. The message of the gospel and the way they had received it brought Paul and Timothy huge joy. So Paul is profoundly grateful, even though he's chained up and with you know, uncertain whether he'll live another month, let alone another year. And that begs the question, how come Paul is so happy? There's something we know, it seems to me, about virtually everyone, or virtually everyone we encounter anywhere in the world, that all of us want to be happy. Now, how we perceive happiness differs from one person to another, but, but psychology will tell us, science will tell us, even common sense will tell us that we all have this one driving ambition in common. We want to be contented and happy. In fact, um, anhedonia, in other words, the absence of joy, hedonia from where we get the word hedonism, anhedonia is a technical term we use to describe depression. So what is the connection between Paul's contentedness, 
his happiness and gratitude. What many people will say, oh, that's easy. When you're happy, you're grateful. But, but think again. Is it really the happy people who are grateful? You know, we've all encountered people who, in this world's terms, have got everything they need to make them happy, and yet they aren't. Because they want something else. Or they want more of the same. And conversely, we all know people who have been bombarded with misfortune and misadventure and sadness and loss, you name it, and yet they are deeply happy. They radiate happiness, some of them. Are you surprised? You shouldn't be, because when you look at these people, you find that nine times out of ten they are grateful people. You see, so, so, so it's not happiness that makes us grateful, it's gratitude that makes us happy. So the secret of Paul's happiness, his contentment, was this. He was consistently grateful. We always thank God. So humanity is engaged in the headlong pursuit of happiness. We call it hedonism. Through fame, through money, through sex, through power, through reputation, you name it. Now, there's nothing wrong with any of these things in of themselves. The reason we don't find happiness there is because the, the God who crafted the human race built us to find our joy in him. The, the best advert for God is Christians who are grateful to him and find their joy in him. In fact, if you're writing notes, make a note of this. That God is glorified most clearly... When we enjoy him most intimately. God is glorified most clearly when we enjoy him most intimately. And that comes as a consequence of being grateful to him. Some of you will have encountered the writer and speaker John Piper. He calls this Christian hedonism. Now, there's, there's, he, he, he says this, there's, there's nothing wrong with the headlong pursuit of happiness so long as we've, we seek, so long as that headlong pursuit is to find happiness in Christ. And when we have happiness in him, all these other things follow. We may not have a successful or a rich life. What the heck? If I'm happy in Christ, I'm actually in touch with the one who made me. I am doing what I was made for. Paul never stopped thanking God. So if we always thank God for you is one headline. There's another one that comes out of this passage. There are just the, these two that I want us to highlight. And that is this. We always pray for you. It's there in verse 9. Since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. Paul's gratitude is matched with earnest and consistent prayer for these people whom he loves. And he says, verse 9, we continually ask God to do certain things. Well, what are those things that he asks God to do? He asks that God, for example, will fill you, in verse 9, fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the spiritual wisdom and understanding. In other words, to have that, that God-given sixth sense to discern what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. Now, actually, um, Paul is doing something ever so slightly crafty here. Um, he doesn't use the conventional word for knowledge, even though that's what we've got printed in English simply because there isn't an English equivalent of what he's doing. What he uses is a term full knowledge or real knowledge, and he does that for a particular reason. You see, later on in the book, and I'm sure Emma or Chris will explain more about this, um, Paul is going to be helping the believers see through a particular heresy. And it runs like this. You can't be a card-carrying Christian unless you've got the knowledge. Unless you've had some 
mystical experience that puts you on a higher spiritual plane along with all of us. That there are class A Christians who've had the experience, who've got the knowledge, and then there are all the others, the, the, the ordinary plebs like you and me. And these people use the word knowledge or gnosis as a catchphrase to describe this experience. And it was wrecking the church, it was splitting the church. Instead of people trusting Christ and living for him, they were seeking this mystical experience. So what Paul does here is he twists the word knowledge ever so slightly to add a little bit on the front. He talks about true knowledge or real knowledge. The, the, in other words, the real thing. So instead of this mystical head-in-the-clouds experience that was intended to be uh, the gateway to class A Christianity, Paul is saying you just need the real knowledge of Christ. And what we have in Christ is the real deal. What we have in Christ is the real deal. So if you have ever encountered or encounter a Christian group that says, oh, you've got to have this experience or that experience before we'll accept you into our ranks, you'll know that Gnosticism is alive and kicking in the 21st century. So Paul prays that God will fill you with the knowledge of his will. He also prays that we will live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. You'll see those words in verse 10. Can I ask you a 24-hour question? In fact, why don't you turn to the person next to you and tell them what you will be doing in 24 hours from now, sort of 10 past 12-ish on Monday morning. Go on, go for it. Okay? What's the most interesting one? Have we got any really, really fascinating <laughs> things there? Where are you going to be? Yeah. You're going to be here. I wonder why. <laughs> Anyone going to be at altitude tomorrow morning? Somebody's flying a plane earlier on today. Uh, anyone, anyone going to be doing something unusual? You didn't expect. I can tell you what I'm going to be doing in 24 hours' time. I'm going to be in Costa Coffee in town. <laughs> I've got an appointment with somebody. We're going to meet up in Costa Coffee. Sorry? You're going to come too now, aren't you? <laughs> Sorry? Oh, they've got Costa Coffee in there? Oh, gosh, how the world has changed in a year. Um, but you see, that 24-hour question is, is, is important because... It gets us thinking about where we're going to be out of this building when we're not in touch with other Christians. That is, that is our front line. And every front line in this room, pretty much, is going to be different. And it may be that you're at work, or it may be that you're in, in your home, or it may be that you'll be talking to someone, or doing some stuff. A question that that bothers some Christians is, how can I live for Christ? How can I live a life worthy of the Lord on a front line where it may be hostile to spiritual conversation and values or where I'm expected to keep my faith in the private arena of life? Can I, can I give you a few steers as to just a couple of suggestions as to how, how you might live for Christ in wherever it is you're going to be in 24 hours' time? How about showing patience? How about seeking the peace and the prosperity of the company you work for or the place you're going to be? God might be calling you to advocate justice. That's what Damien and Danette are doing, albeit in Mozambique. You can, you know, we can model honesty. 
And the thing that so many folk in the non-Christian society in which we sit find difficult to understand, you can practice forgiveness. And when we live like that, we are living a life worthy of our calling. Verse 10, pleasing him in every way and bearing fruit in every good work that we do. Growing in the full knowledge or the high knowledge, there's that word again, of God. And this, this hints at another uh, challenge facing the Christ followers in Colossae and that also faces us today. You see, some of the false teachers in this town were placing <coughs> enormous pressure on the church to dilute their faith in order to make it more acceptable. You know, take a bit of this philosophy here and a bit of that faith stream here. You know, we'll have a bit of Islam, we'll have a bit of Buddhism, we'll have a bit of New Age stuff, um, we'll take some of the Bible and we'll, we'll work it all together. We call it syncretism. Possibly with the very laudable aim of being relevant and being understandable and acceptable to people living around them. That, that's, you know, relevance is a, is a noble aim. I know from the time that, that I was working with you that relevance to our society was, was high up on our, uh, our scale of values. And I'm confident it still is. You know, relevance is good, but it should never be done at the expense of the truths of the gospel. Because it's those very truths, those very ideas which have the capacity to transform us. Dilute the gospel and you will instantly weaken the very thing that gives the message of Christ its power. You see, we have been rescued, says Paul. From something dark and brought into genuine, joy-filled light. And the message of the gospel, if you're not familiar with it, my friend, the message of the gospel is disarmingly straightforward. That, that God, the creator of the cosmos, who put all this whole thing in place and is responsible for your existence and mine, that God loves you. He genuinely cares about you. In fact, he cares so much that he put himself on the line for you. He gave himself on your behalf. So that the very life of joy and peace and forgiveness and genuine happiness that he created you and me for can be ours when we put him in the driving seat of our lives. And the rest is detail. When we put him in the driving seat of our lives, we discover that we've been forgiven for our wrongdoing. We discover that we are adopted into his family. Put Jesus first and all these other things follow. Forgiveness and purpose and a deep sense of freedom. Gosh. Basically, what the world out there calls happiness. Whatever circumstances might get thrown at us. I was preaching on a different passage a few weeks ago. And I was preaching on a similar sort of area that God loves us and he has adopted us as children into his family, that your heavenly father is a father. And he loves you like the best father would. And a lady came up to me afterwards. She was well connected in the church been a Christian for a long time, someone I know, love and respect. And she said to me, Ian, thank you for telling me God loves me. Because I don't hear much of that at home. And my heart went out to her. My friend, my friend, can I assure you, God loves you. 
not in a slushy romantic way, but in the sort of way that wants the very best for you. He cares for you. He paid the ultimate price for you. So that you could find your happiness in him. Let's pray together, shall we? Maybe if you're one of those people who has not really taken a step of faith and come to know all the stuff I've been talking about this morning, maybe you'd like to say these words with me. Not out loud, just in your heart, because God hears what goes on there. <clears throat> hears it better than we do, actually. Heavenly Father, I thank you that as the creator of the cosmos, you really care about me. I don't fully understand that, but I thank you that it's a reality. And I'm so grateful that you gave yourself on my behalf. Lord, as best I can in this moment, I want you to be in the driving seat of my life. Forgive me for anything that I know is, is, is wrong, is out of kilter with that. But above all, Lord, please take the lead in my life. Take, the, take over the reins, I pray. And for those of us who don't hear much about the love of God or don't see it practiced much, Let's talk about that with the Lord. Heavenly Father, you know my heart. You know that I don't often hear or feel that you love me. But now, just in this moment, I open myself as much as I can to receive your love, to receive your forgiveness, I'm grateful to you, Lord, for what you've done. Father, create in me that joy that comes from the gratitude that I've just expressed to you. And we'll give God, by his Holy Spirit, a moment just to do that, shall we? Thank you, Lord.